first, if, if y'all don't mind, so excuse me, I'm sure this is different than the typical um, uh, kind of meetups have gone, but I'd love to just, since I haven't joined yet, um, love to just get to know you all really quickly. So sorry for putting on my like former high school teacher hat here, but could, could we share our name and um, uh, one thing, <laughs> either one thing that you're good at Please, please entertain me, or you don't have to entertain me, but consider it. Um, one thing that you're good at that you don't like to do, or one thing that you don't like to do that you're good at. So um, I should probably start since I'm pitching this here. Actually, can I have like 10 seconds to think about this first? Unless someone has one on, in mind. It's kind of hard. That's kind of like it's kind of like the off diagonal of like things that we typically do. All right. I, uh, so my name is Josh. There goes my phone. My name is Josh Rosenberg, and I um, uh, I'm in Maxwell, Tennessee. You can say where you are if you like. I'm sure y'all are familiar with each other's um, uh, work and interest by now. So if you can share that, that'd be great. And I'm. Um, I'm a science teacher educator at the University of Tennessee in Knoxville, and I um, am pretty good at like um, taking care of like outdoors things like my yard. Um, but I just, I have just grown to really dislike like not just weeding, but like there's a lot of vines here and I just cannot stand dealing with the vines. I'm just kind of done with them. They just constantly grow everywhere and have to spend like all weekend taking them out. So that's my thing. Who's next? I'm Rob uh, Lucas. I'm in Durham, North Carolina. Um, I would say I'm uh, good at writing and I don't like doing it. It drives me up the wall. Uh, nice. I'm Ronnie Patel. I'm in currently North Carolina I was since Monday. I was in Seattle, but I moved on Monday and now we have no class. Um, I would say, um, I'm good at teaching high school kids chemistry because that's what I did for seven years. I actually hate chemistry. Um, I just, I was a major and I was just a bit enough at chemistry and was teaching older kids. So I picked teaching juniors and seniors over sophomores, which I don't regret that at all, but I hate chemistry. <laughs> hate it. Where, like, where did you move? Or to where did you move? I'm in Greenville, North Carolina right now for like a month and then uh, moving up to Maryland next month. Greenville. Greenville's in like Eastern North Carolina. Oh, it's out there. Oh yeah. Yeah. Ah, yeah. I spent three years there before. before oh really? Did you go to ECU? I, I taught at ECU for a while. Oh, oh cool. Awesome. Yeah. My fiance is a traditional fellowship there. So. More weeks in the country. I can go. Hi everyone. I'm Isabella Velasquez. I usually live in Seattle right now. I am in Texas. Um, and I am not very good at math logic puzzles, but I love math logic puzzles. <laughs> and I spend a lot of time looking up and watching videos on math logic puzzles <laughs> that I cannot solve myself. So. Learn something new about my co author. <laughs> uh, hi, I'm Morgan Grovenberg. I'm the retention specialist at Northeastern State uh, in Oklahoma. And I guess this is a really hard question. Um, and I had it when I started and then I forgot it. Hold on. Um, no, you'll have to come back to me because I had it, but I, I forgot it. <laughs> <laughs> It'll return. Uh, Ryan, Edgar, or Alyssa? Uh, yeah, uh, I'm Ryan Woodbury. I'm in South Bend, Indiana. Um, and uh, one thing that I'm that I'm good at, and this is makes my wife so happy, is like I feel like I'm good at the dishes. I'm, I'm very particular about like how they're loaded into a dishwasher, but I hate doing the dishes. Um, but that is my job, right? Um, so. Yes, that is, I just hate doing the dishes, but I'm particular and got, have gotten good at it. Uh, 
Uh, I'm Edgar Zamora. I live in uh, Moses Lake, Washington. Um, I think similar to Ryan, I like to wash in the dishes, but I don't like to put them away. Uh, <laughs> it's, I don't know, something about putting them away. And same thing with laundry. I, I like to fold laundry, but the hassle of putting them in the laundry is, is the worst. Sorry, I missed the question. <laughs> like, I know we were introducing ourselves, but what are we supposed to? Oh, sorry, Alyssa. Hi. Um, so um, just introducing ourselves briefly and um, uh, identifying something that's sort of in, uh, so to speak, off diagonal kind of task um, in that it's something that we either um, like to do, but are not good at, or do not like to do, but are good at. So off diagonal in the sense that it's not something we like to do and are good at, which is somewhat common and things that we don't like to do and, and aren't good at. So not one of those. It might take a little bit of time and reflection. Yeah, that's come up <laughs> um, well, first I'll introduce myself. My name is Alyssa. Okay. I live in um, Rochester, New York right now. Um, so I'm moving to Buffalo for the summer. Um, and I'd like to do like long, like, road trips, like driving long distances, I find it very nice, but I'm not a good night driver, I guess. <laughs> so I, I get kind of like weirded out by all the lights and and yeah, so it's kind of, I don't know if that fits. The yeah, it's a good one. All right, I remembered. I, I'm pretty good at making, cooking food that tastes good with uh, whatever's in my house. So not really planning ahead, but then making something that tastes good, but I hate cooking. I hate it. <laughs> it's kind of interesting. I feel like I could read like a whole book of these on people. I, I guess it's um, just like, yeah, anyway. Um, so um, I um, read through the repository and looked through recent Slack messages to kind of try to calibrate what to present today. And what I ended up with, I think, is a little bit different, despite that calibration effort, um, from what you've been talking about, in part because this chapter didn't involve code. This chapter was more about sort of um, kind of ideas or concepts that could inform how you teach others to do data science. So accordingly, I have a few slides with some kind of summaries um, or takeaways from the chapter, but there's no code, which... Um, is definitely a feature of the uh, Jeringen slides that I saw many of you other uh, many of you use like really robustly and, um, and in cool ways. And actually, I I, gro I grokked the theme from whoever presented last, I think in mid April. So it's a really nice theme that you uh, that you used. Um, so without further ado, I'll share some slides and I have a few discussion questions too. Actually, kind of after each part of the presentation. And um, I mean, in some ways, these are discussion questions because this is a book club. I'm also really genuinely interested in. Um, some of your thoughts on teaching data science. It's an interest of mine. I'm a former science teacher and I work with future science teachers, but I also am really interested in data science education. And I think this is like a really new and cool area where there's a lot of innovation that can take place around how we teach data science, whether it's a peer in our workplace or a friend who's interested or a class of students, um, and also the tools that we use. So R is like, I think we all somewhat agree that R is a great tool. It can still be really hard to learn. And when I think about kind of handing somebody who's never used R before, kind of a link to our studio and to our, it's still, it doesn't quite seem like that's um, enough oftentimes, even, even with a nice kind of set of instructions for how to install them and get started. It's just such a barrier from kind of creating your first plot, a uh, gap between creating your first plot and kind of um, never having written a line of code before and installing these tools on your computer. So um, I mean, I'm really interested in hearing um, what y'all have found works or what you think um, could be some good directions to um, kind of build out to make it easier for others to learn R. So, um, actually, before we begin, do y'all have any questions or kind of uh, anything that you'd like to do around the other meetings? Again, I haven't, um, I haven't joined yet, so um, please excuse me for any kind of things I'm doing idiosyncratically. Okay. No, go on. Yeah. <clears throat> So um, the three um, kind of objectives that I wanted to take away from today, I hope this is kind of what is meant by learning objectives, is to talk about, discuss some of the pedagogical features embedded within the book, um, to talk about some general strategies around teaching data science, and then to overcome 
or to discuss some ways to overcome barriers to doing data science in the future. So kind of almost like um, us using using some of the space to kind of brainstorm like what we could do next or what others could do next, kind of a little agenda setting around this. Um, but before that, um, so we already got to know each other a little bit. So this is a little different, not really, sorry, um, getting to know each other, but kind of getting introduced to this topic. In response to the question, how should I get started doing data science? Um, not what would you recommend they do first, but what would you recommend they do first, second, and third? Because I find like, I feel like, you know, what, what we do first is sort of, um, in some ways it's, it's kind of easy and not enough at the same time. Easy, not enough, maybe something else too. Um, so what, what would you have them do? Like, all right, here's a list of three things to do to get started. And you could try to kind of get them on their way. So um, again, I'm sorry, I can't take off my high school teacher hat. If, um, can we do breakout rooms like in two groups of four for like five minutes and then come back together on this? Is, it, is that kind of, would that be okay? Or would you all prefer I, to discuss I'm one group? I'm not sure if we have access to breakout rooms. <laughs> okay, uh, I don't see them either here. Okay, well, that's okay. We're a small enough group. I think this is totally fine. Um, so maybe we can kind of just pause for about, um, I'll set a timer for 30 seconds. And if you want to like jot down a few notes, um, we can start discussing in about half a minute. All right, I got one thing written down. <laughs> Not sure if others made it a little further than me. Do, do y'all want another couple moments? Um, uh, I'll, I'll go without. Yeah, thanks. So without ever teaching anyone R before or data science, <laughs> but this is just my opinion. Um, I would probably suggest someone going through a book like R for Data Science or a quick course um, to get introduced to it and learn like what functionality is out there um, and then identify and then second identify a problem they want to work on um, and go for it. Google a lot, right? So try to try to get through it create some sort of rough draft analysis. And then third, find, find some people to review and critique and say, you know, what they would have done instead. That's, that's what I would suggest if I was hypothetically help, helping someone learn data science. And I guess specifically programming uh, with it. Uh, thank you, Morgan. Um, anyone um, agree or disagree with particular parts of um, Morgan's three-part approach? I agree with the uh, following kind of like an area, like data science is so broad. There's like data science in education. There's like data science in sports. There's data science in chem. And I think finding that area that you want to kind of go into and then like exploring from there, whether it be like Google searches. I know Twitter is very helpful in that sphere of like, I think first is just casting a wide net and finding, you know, like-minded people that you can like kind of see, oh, this is how you do it. And this is how they've done it. And I think my second step would then be to look at their code and to kind of follow their logic. Because if you've never done like data science, it can get it, be very intimidating from the beginning of saying, you know, open up our studio and, you know, go away at it. It can be very challenging. And so I think following other people and just you know do this thing or how do I summarize or how do I do counts and I think following people and then the very last thing you should do is then do it on yourself so that way I think you can kind of get a better idea instead of jumping straight into it it's I think something that, that the way I would approach it
So I put the problem part first, or identifying a problem of interest to you. The only trick with that is if you might not know what is possible, it might be a little bit hard to identify what a problem is, but I would, uh, I guess maybe compared to what Morgan said, I would shorten it to reading a chapter or something like as short as possible that might just get, get you a little bit of scope about what, what kinds of problems are um, tractable to data science methods and then get working on one as soon as possible. And I had not put the thing about finding people to connect with and I didn't have a third. So I definitely think that um, that should be really high on the list. Um, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Alyssa. Oh, thanks. Uh, I was thinking um, in kind of a different direction, like going hyper specific, like saying some kind of product or like a plot or a table or something that somebody else has done, identifying like something that you want to recreate or something. The second step being like how to change it, either change the data set, change, I don't know, the look of the plot or something, something very like tractable and like doable. And then the third is, I don't know, I didn't come up with the third, but I just kind of like, I guess the opposite way from book to like actual product that you hope to like feel accomplished at the end. So, you know, like you have momentum to keep going and then it's doable. I also started with uh, like an interest, like, you know, sports or, you know, anything. Um, I also thought I should probably pick a language first and obviously I'm gonna push R since we're all here, but I feel like you know, there's many different tools to do what people need to get done, so. Yeah, I, I, I like um, a lot of this and, and something that I've done, I mean, I don't think anyone's asked me this question, like how should I get started in data science? I just kind of like tell people, hey, you should get started in data science. Um, and, uh, and so I try to, um, you know, understand their need, like my first recommendation is like, just to understand them. Cause if I'm going to be a possible mentor, um, I wouldn't, I, I don't even know what my first step would be based on to, unless I knew that. Right. Um, and, uh, and so, but I, then I would probably use one or many of all, all of these recommendations. Um, but then one, one other one that's kind of away from programming is just understanding like the importance and asset of data. Um, you know, they may ask the question about, hey, I wanna get started in data science, but it's like, okay, you know, how would you use that? What is, you know, what is your vision of becoming more data, uh, you know, literate, more data savvy? Um, and just trying to understand that and help them build out a little bit of data literacy. And that, I think that could come with, you know, some of the book chapters that are recommended. Um, and some other resources and, and mentor or community type things, you know, before they even start programming. I'm stealing this from uh, a course I took this spring, but there was a question asked for the beginning about just how are you using data in your life? Actually, I think it might've been analytics. How are you using analytics in your life? But it, it encouraged people to start thinking about, you know, just different um, apps and tools for gathering data that are already out there that I thought was a pretty productive kind of reflection to get started on early. My three steps very much echo what everybody else has said um, to start off writing out like what they would like to do or see and then like think through the steps of what would need to happen in order to make that possible whether that's finding data or um, you know, um, like programming or anything else. And whenever I help people out in programming, I just send a lot of examples that are similar to what they're hoping to do, because um, that's the way that I learn. <laughs> and so uh, just being able to provide um, things that mirror uh, their vision so that, you know, they can adapt it and, and change it to, to meet what they're hoping to do. It's 
these are great. Um, so um, uh, I'll move on to the next um, next slide, which is just a brief kind of informal overview of some of the pedagogical principles for the book. And these were um, elaborated on a little bit in the chapter. So um, one principle that informed our um, focus on um, writing out eight walkthroughs was the idea of um, learning being more motivating and a context for learning specific skills when it's situated around real world um, topics or challenges. Um, so the walkthroughs were designed with kind of actual problems that we faced in our work, the five of us as co-authors um, in mind. Um, that said, I think one tension here with problem-based learning is that um, a book like R for Data Science takes a more um, kind of um, individual function or kind of con concept kind of focus to the book. So for instance, you can, I think, flip to a chapter of R for Data Science on joins or a chapter on iteration um, or a chapter on, um, I forget how kind of select and filter and rename are introduced, but I wouldn't be surprised if each other own chapter. Um, and so in some ways that's easier to consult, whereas, whereas in the walkthrough approach, kind of we try to pull out what functions were introduced when, um, but R for Data Science might be, um, might have different affordances, I think. Um, so just highlighting that this is kind of um, a choice we made, but um, one that makes the book kind of well suited for particular purposes, seeing what kind of analyzing gradebook data is like, or what analyzing educational social media data is like, or um, doing machine learning with learning system data. Um, but it might be a little bit um, less different from what the next kind of book. Um, we focused on differentiation too, and I just want to highlight two things. One is differentiation. So chapters five and six, I think, um, are a kind of a, a good place for somebody who's never used R before to understand like in chapter five, literally how to install the two, um, those two uh, programs, um, R Studio and R. And then chapter six, I think does a nice job of introducing some big ideas. Um, and I'll, I'll say more on that in a second in that building mental models um, bullet. Um, working in the open was super important to us. And this is something that I think all five of us were on the same page about. Um, and um, just like yielded so many benefits. So we wrote the book, as I think many of you know, through GitHub, and that meant others could contribute to the book in terms of making suggestions, correcting errors, um, suggesting improvements. Um, and so working in the open also, it also attracted a lot of attention to the book in a way that I don't think if we just sort of worked, 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 and then public, you know, we, we would have had the same degree of buy-in and, and community support. And, um, so that was, um, a principle that we think we could kind of turn on its head a little bit and and say, um, when you're learning to um, use R, um, you can also probably experience some benefits from working in the open, participating in Tidy Tuesday, participating in the R for Data Science um, group, um, uh, blogging and sharing uh, with R stats on Twitter, and it can just be a great and motivating way to share your work. Um, Jesse was really a, um, an advocate of building mental models. Um, on the part of kind of learners. And she, I think, advocated for this through uh, developing a framework that um, she called uh, the foundational skills framework. And these are sort of four, um, four parts of most analyses, projects, functions, packages, and data. Um, and just by kind of naming it and saying it has four parts, um, it can help people new to R to kind of see, okay, I don't have to learn, you know, 16 things. Um, and I don't have to learn just, just this one big thing. Like I can kind of get my head around this by focusing on four things um, that we can organize our work around projects that we use functions to um, take steps to um, achieve the aims that we're trying to in our analysis, whether that's preparing data and processing it or joining it or modeling it, or visualizing it, <laughs> um, using packages to add on functionality and then um, using one or more um, kind of objects that represent data. Um, so that was a... Um, a pedagogical principle that um, informed especially that sixth chapter. Um, but we also tried to kind of highlight the conceptual ideas to build learners' mental models at other points too. And then this last one was sort of one that we didn't feel like we fully addressed, universal design. So we did work to be inclusive in terms of the examples we used and the language that we used and um, the data that we selected. Um, but in terms of accessibility, we have further to go. So for instance, um, there were steps that we could take to make the book more accessible to readers who, um, who are blind, who use a screen reader. We did not pay attention to this. We didn't really check the book to be um, uh, compatible with guidelines for how to um, produce 
fully accessible um, web-based resources. So I think that's something we'd like to take on in the future, maybe in the next edition. Um, so we had an aim in our book proposal um, um, of using universal design. And that was one that we, we didn't fully meet, but we kind of fessed up to it in this chapter here. Um, so um, two, two questions I have um, in, in the context of these pedagogical principles is, um, just really briefly, because we're not looking for compliments here. What was helpful to you as a, as a reader of the book, if you don't mind? Um, but more importantly, what additional, um, sorry for the strange parentheses, <laughs> what additional helpful features um, could be added or created? So what, what features could be added to, to this book or what features could be created for other books that, are, um, that have this intent of um, teaching um, data science? And this can be like, books or features or resources for like educational data science or just kind of bringing this educational lens to any book um, and kind of, sorry, let me just be a little clearer about that. Um, these could be features that are specific to a reader who is doing data science and education like, like us, um, or it can be um, some uh, feature that maybe you have identified from your work in education or that you believe is useful for teaching and learning that could be used in any book. So I, I think as a like as an intermediate R user, um, I felt like the walkthroughs were really helpful for me because I kind of already am familiar with the functions and the things of the, you know, from the tidyverse or from, you know, other things I can understand documentation. Um, so I, you know, I enjoyed the walkthroughs because I did focus on a problem. Um, and, and, and so I thought that was helpful and kind of walking through something as close to end to end as possible um, to see like, Oh, I can do something within a chapter. I can, ask a question, have a product by the end of the chapter. Um, so I thought that was helpful, um, especially if people are trying to wrap their heads around some of these steps that we've offered, you know? Um, so I think, I think that was something that I've enjoyed. It was just really helpful to me to, encounter these concepts in the educational context. It made it a lot more meaningful. I've you know, done tutorials of different kinds in other subject matter and um, you know, they didn't motivate me very well or didn't uh, seem like they had practical applications in work that I might wanna do. So it was really great to be able to see them applied you know, in, in a field I identify with. Um, I, I thought the walkthroughs were helpful uh, and a good compliment to other things that I've done. But if I had to pick, I think I, I've gotten more out of um, slightly, I don't wanna say more open-ended, but ones that involved pausing and then me having to answer questions or figuring out how to do things. Whereas this kind of spoon feeds you the next step, you know, at every point. Um, and I don't know exactly how you recreate that in a book. I'm thinking more um, of interactive things online, but uh, I think that, you know, active thinking there, there's maybe room for more of it, or ways of pausing and, and letting the person figure something out and then providing the answer or something like that. Yeah, that's great, Rob. It's, I, I taught a class this semester, um, and, and Ryan too, thank you. Um, I taught a class that was an introduction to data science and education using R, and I um, started working on changing some of the walkthroughs into something more like a homework or an independent practice, um, where like there's some code, but then you have to write code too. Um, and so um, I, I, I was spending a good bit of time checking out the um, like the, the book down associated with this group, and I think that could be um, maybe a place where those kinds of walkthroughs could live. Um, it could kind of be like an accompanying kind of guide for the book that you could use for teaching or independent learning it could be helpful.
I think for me, uh, I kind of going off what Rob said, I think some of the other books, it's like some of these topics, yeah, they teach you good things, but it's like education is very, and the kind of data they have is very particular. The thing I liked about this is, you know, I can make the connection to, oh, I have this data at work. You know, I can use, you know, the examples. Now I can see how I can take concepts from the tidyverse or concept from R and actually apply it to things that I know and that I have access to versus like uh, applying it to uh, like business data or and some kind of data that necessarily doesn't very, doesn't connect that well. And so that's something that I think the topics themselves, I think are, are very applicable for education. I did enjoy the topics itself saying, you know, I could go do this myself. I could just follow, follow the book chapter, the walkthrough, and then do it myself uh, easily. And so I think that's something that I like. Um, and I think another thing that I think uh, maybe could have been mentioned, I think for me especially, I think data stored other than like CSV files and flat files, I think there's a growing, uh, growing push toward like data warehouses and you know Amazon web services and whatever it be some online services I think maybe some mention of like oh you can connect through it with like a dplyr or you can connect through it with you know these other connections you know our studio has connections have I think uh, that maybe an acknowledgement on that of like you know we can't go full in, into it but I think it's something that people should be aware of because there are other re connectivity than just like Excel files and those are though they are predominant. Isabella, I saw you nodding, or I, I I thought I saw you light up a little bit when Edgar mentioned that. Do you do you yeah. agree that do you have thoughts on that? Um, kind of including content on accessing databases or other um kind of storage places for data. Yeah, well, <laughs> what what that reminded me of is um, a, like. Like there's so much in our studio that I feel like, <laughs> like I keep learning more about it. And um, it just made me realize like, you know, we have the, the beginning chapters, it's installing R in our studio, but we don't really come back to it, like, you know, directly in the text um, once the walkthroughs uh, start. And so, um, so it, that resonated with me, both because of all the features that our studio has, particularly for, the beginner R users that we were thinking about, and also to just kind of bring more uh, continuity, like of the topic throughout the, like throughout the book. So, Isabella, are there other things like specifics that you would want to include in like um, in another edition? Uh, I have a running list of issues for us <laughs> to address at some point <laughs> in the future when we all have a ton of free time. Um, I, I think one thing that like really like from this book club that I've really been thinking about is the the walkthroughs very much concentrate on like the technical aspects of importing data, cleaning data, visualizing data, et cetera. And, um, but like, there's like the real human aspect of data analysis and like explaining it to folks and being like, this is what this means and this is how you can use it and not, um, that I don't think we focused on in the book because we were focused on the technical aspect, um, but makes me realize like it's, it's crucial part of data science um, that, that we could develop further. Anyone who hasn't um, hasn't had a chance to say anything yet that you'd like to share? I'm sort of interested in learn R. Um, putting on my education hat again, I think they kind of have these uh, kind of behaviorist. Um, kind of philosophical or 
psychological assumptions and that it's sort of rote. Um, but I'm sort of personally a pluralist when it comes to like teaching strategies. And I think there's definitely or there's definitely cases where just sort of practicing using a function can be helpful. So like maybe you've learned about a function and there are different arguments that you need to try out or see how it works to join columns that are like um, that have different data types or um, you can think of a ton of examples where there's just like lots like you can learn the big idea, but there's lots of different edge cases that can be good to practice. So I think LearnR could be helpful for those kind of building LearnR tutorials that go along with the book. Um, I wouldn't mind having a little more kind of like um, a little more of kind of what R for data science does so well in terms of introducing functions and showing how they work. Um, I, I think I sort of foreshadowed that by kind of self teaching approach a little bit, even though I would, I would do this, I would think we would use the same approach again if we were. So maybe a little more kind of elaboration on specific functions. Um, and then there's just so many things with R that are changing right now, like for machine learning, um, Carrot, I think is still supported. I think y'all just worked through, walk through eight. Um, but now of course, tidy models has become quite well developed. Um, as an aside, holy, holy smokes, tidy models is like a whole world. It's like, has anyone tried or explored it yet? It's, um, Brian, you have when I, um, I was really overwhelmed just because um, it's almost like tidyverse sized in terms of scope, like how ambitious it is. Um, so um, I think that'd be something really neat to explore in um, in, in walkthrough eight. Um, uh, Isabella, deep player, one point out, yeah, yeah, a lot of a lot of kind of medium to small sized updates too. Um, yeah, it changes so fast; it's kind of fun part. Um, so we also um, elaborated on some. Okay, sorry. Does anyone have any other thoughts on kind of features that could be embedded in a book that could be helpful? I'll use my teacher weight move. Um, uh, just some like general strategies that could apply for like teaching a colleague or a friend or could apply in like something more like a formal learning context. Um, one thing we read about is providing a home base. So, um, uh, especially like in a workshop, it can just be really disorienting to have like PDFs of resources and a website and then your RStudio window and maybe a screen that you're looking at um, in the class or a Zoom window. So trying to have some home base where like everything is linked is just sort of a, can be a helpful strategy for teaching a technical, or, uh, technical skill like coding. Um, Another thing that we write about is writing code early and often. So um, it's sort of tempting to start like when teaching somebody, at least for me, if it has been like to talk about like how great R is and like talk about the history of R and talk about how it's different than other statistical software. And um, I think what I would do differently now is just sort of start with, start with like a select function or filter and just have people like write out some code and reason about what's going on, predict what's going on. Um, you can back into those details later on. And um, uh, I'll touch, I want to circle back to something on that with starting with early wins in a minute. So two other things first. Um, this is something that um, uh, a book called Teaching Tech Together um, writes about really nicely. Um, it's a nice book by Greg Wilson. Um, don't touch that keyboard. Um, uh, it can be really tempting when you're working with somebody to just kind of like, oh no, just type it like this. Um, but there's some benefits to um, like someone new, new to using R to become familiar with like, like tabbing over a little bit or like uh, replacing that uh, parenthesis with a curly bracket. Um, so just trying to like, just say, no, it's okay. You can work on it. It's okay if it takes another, you know, 15 seconds for you to, to write this where I could probably just fix that right away. Um, uh, the curse of knowledge uh, refers to the difficulty that um, humans have, or at least many humans have um, of you know, recollecting uh, what, your knowledge and skills were like when you were first learning something or when we were first learning something. And so um, it kind of just, uh, we wrote about just how it can be valuable just to anticipate issues that um, you might not expect, um, even really foundational kind of issues around um, like where to write code, like where does it go in our studio and um, like do spaces matter, things that you might anticipate already, but um, others may not. Um, and then, um, Something that's a little maybe controversial um, that Teaching Tech Together writes about too is to sacrifice accuracy for clarity. Um, I think the way I would amend this personally is to try to be generally accurate 
Um, so like, don't say things that aren't true. Like, um, uh, I don't have a great example on top of my mind. Maybe others do, but, um, but try to emphasize being clear and pragmatic early on. So like, for instance, it's probably not that important for um, someone who's struggling to join two data frames together um, to hear a ton about the different kind of uh, types of vectors and how everything in R is built on vectors and um, how an integer is different from a double. Like it, it's probably just more helpful for the learners to know kind of you can you can store data in different forms. And sometimes those can be something more like a word and other times they can be numbers and they have to be the same type. <laughs> and so I think especially the more we learn about R, we get geeked out on like, oh, this is not working because this is this kind of object. And um, and it, it can be better to try to just be kind of generally accurate. Um, not to be misleading, but also not to get too into the detail. Um, start with early wins. This is something I learned this semester, and I really want to try to emphasize, like whether I'm teaching like a colleague or um, or a class again, is like even if like someone's like wrangling data and they're learning about mutate or they're learning about a range or select or filter, um, have that work towards something, even if it's like an interesting table or even better a visualization, um, because even for the most motivated learners, it can be kind of a slog to work through just like. Um, uh, just kind of preparing data without seeing some end in sight. Um, so um, that, that kind of relates to writing code early and often, like having some interesting data set that you use for examples or that you, um, I think this relates to like some of the things we talked about early on of having um, someone you were teaching identify something they're interested in because then they can bring some data. And even if it's a data set with 20 rows and six columns, um, it can be really motivating to try to summarize that data and do things as simple as count up how many times um, uh, a value occurs in a column or something using the player counter. Um, just, just working with your own data can be really motivating. Um, we touched on this earlier, but um, considering representation and inclusion, um, even in things like the data that we use and the examples that we provide. Um, so it can be really tempting, for instance, to um, kind of, as an example of a dichotomous variable, use um, gender. Um, or or race when um, like a comparing white to non-white students um, sends it can send a message to the people who we are um, trying to teach are um, that we don't want to send and that um, um, it can take some additional work to kind of find data sets or examples that um, uh, that are a little bit um, uh, uh, represent kind of values of um, being inclusive, maybe at the stage that those data sets were created. Um, and then there's a lot of great resources to draw on, including in CS Ed. I think there's a lot of opportunities for like, those of us interested in educational data science to think about what we can learn and contribute to like CS Ed too. Um, so sorry if this is a little in the weeds in terms of like teaching in formal classes. I hope some of this is relevant to um, the kinds of like, like, um, goals you might have when teaching data science. Um, so two questions I have here are, um, what are some other helpful teaching strategies that you've found? And then how do these strategies look different with different like ages of um, uh, those learning data science in, in different contexts, like a workplace versus um, <laughs> some, just a friend versus a classroom versus a workshop? So I've just started teaching our team, um, or two, fo two folks on our team are, and um, I'm stumbling through the dark as I put these lessons together, I'm like five weeks into it. Uh, so one helpful thing is they both um, are fellow PhDs, but they did all of their work in SPSS, so they had that stats background, which is really helpful. And so to make the learning of the, but they have no programming language, was, uh, you know, experience whatsoever, so I kind of put myself, myself in their shoes from a couple years ago and I started with um, education data and so I just went on I think cable and just found the cable and found like a, there's a student data set on there so we just been exploring that and I started with visualizations and now we're doing um, some you know cleaning of the data and, and uh, it's all been tidy first and so I think keeping it uh, contextual within the folks you're working with is really important just so they have that level of familiarity because it's looking at our studio set up for the first time is, is really it can be very intimidating and so I wanted to make this comfortable as possible for them and um, you know, visualizations was a great place to start with that with data that they knew. So. 
Um, so my boss has been in position for 25 years and she uses access a lot and that's what she used. And so I think my strategy kind of showing her instead of like, oh, access was good. Like not just stick with R, I think it's trying to make that comparison of like, and access, this is how you do it. And this is how you do it in R, you know, uh, the group by here's the equivalent in R, the, you know, distinct here's the equivalent in access. And so making that like a smooth transition and steadily introducing instead of saying, you know, let's just go full R and, you know, just use all the concepts. And I think that slowly but surely she's, she, she's very hesitant in the beginning and now she's like very forward. She's like, it's super powerful and, and you can do way more. And it's just like, yeah, like access and SQL have it's like their limitations. So I think making sure you can, uh, you can make those parallels where the transition is not so abrupt and it's slowly but surely they can ease their way into it is something that I think is is helpful. Um, what I struggle with, so I'm probably newer to all this than most of the people here, um, but I just find myself learning things and able to do them. And then I, I step away for a couple weeks and I've forgotten everything um, for, you know, a couple months. Um, and I, I mean, I'm sure you're well aware of it, but I really wish I had a systematic way to like revisit concepts. Um, periodically like people do with flashcards where you uh, practice it you know regularly and once you've got it down you can practice it less regularly um, but it still comes up occasionally or something you know I'm talking about there um, this is sort of about space practice and and memory and such but I wish I had a better way of like calling on things at the right time because I feel like I'm always um, always letting it go too long and then forgetting it and having to to learn it back again. I'm not sure if that's a strategy, but I wish I had a good solution to that. Yeah, that's helpful, Lucas. I think in some ways the absence of these kinds of tools kind of um, is a function of um, not a lot of educational research like research on space practice and, um, and memory work being, being drawn on. Um, and I think that's changing. Like the R Studio education team is great, and they're doing great, uh, creating great resources. But a lot of opportunities still to bring educational ideas into teaching data science. Uh, any one other person have anything that you'd um, like to share? Otherwise, proceed to the last set of questions. Can add anything in the chat too? Thanks. You can tell I'm I'm taking notes. That I'm not, you're not like a research subject. I just think these are ideas that I want to explore more. Um, uh, so um, what's next? Um, there's a lot of growth and interest in data science education. Um, thank you. Thank you all again for like taking the time to read the book. Um, it's funny, like, I feel like Isabel and I have been like gifted a lot of great like community support and feedback, but like hearing about how you all use parts of the book has been really gratifying. I think in some ways you don't, as an author, get to hear that kind of input. So thanks for sharing that and taking the time to read the book and do this again. Thanks, Ryan, for organizing this, as well as others um, who have been involved in organizing. I think, um, yeah, I think, Brian, you've led it, but uh, thanks to all of you. Um, I guess like big picture, um, learning to do data science is still really hard. Um, it, it's kind of, it's harder than other things, I think. Um, and so I, I guess as a last question, I'm curious, what are some big gaps in resources? Um, one thing I think about, for instance, uh, this is all I'll say on this, is um, I think there's a lot of potential to use R in the younger grade levels. Like there's no reason why learners have to wait until they get to a graduate level class or a certain, if they're kind of fortunate, undergraduate degree class to learn R. Um, there's fortunately a lot of good initiatives in this country, in the US, um, to help uh, young learners to program. Um, tools like Scratch, for instance, um, and 
like code-based programming languages. Um, why not in data science? Um, it seems like it could be an engaging context and that these could be valuable skills that could serve students well in a lot of future educational kind of contexts and also in a lot of jobs. So what are some big gaps and resources that, that exist? Or what are some, some even like kind of pie in the sky, like this would take a lot of work, but um, be cool if this existed. Thing that I've found in various like coding courses that I've taken is you know different approaches like I've seen courses where they have um, a script and then they blank out a part of it and, and you're supposed to go in fill it in you know there's some where people walk through code and I, I guess like I am wondering if there's like a meta analysis of like when to do what <laughs> and for what purpose and um and what is like better for teaching what and um just because like again like just to take the example of the of the code chunks that are that have uh, blocks like sometimes it works really well and, and sometimes it really doesn't and I, um i guess that, that's one thing i've wondered about so um i have i have kids in k-12 right and like a couple of them, I mean, actually like my, yeah, like my kindergartners doing coding type stuff or Coast Park Academy or something like that. And uh, and a lot of it seems to be like very either gamified or like focused on robotic type, you know, like moving a foo or a robot around. And that like, I think that's really exciting. Again, that's kind of like um, scratch type coding, um, but uh, making that, um, you know, if there's a way to build out some sort of gamified data science um, <clears throat> program for kids, that's where I feel, at least I haven't seen any, and maybe there, maybe there are uh, things out there. But as of right now, what I'm seeing introduced to young kids is, is games, right? Um, and coding games and things. Um, and because they get excited about moving a thing around, a robot around to an objective, um, and either making that making that free framed in sort of a data science way rather than a, a just a robot game, um, but a data science game. I think that'd be really interesting to see how that would play out as they got older and moved into data a data science role, a machine learning role, rather than you know robotics role um, or the many other roles that are out there. <laughs> I think for me personally, I think I didn't learn R until grad school. You know, I hoped I would have learned it earlier, but I think there's this, like, to me, it seems like there's a misconception that like data science, you got to be like, you got to work for Facebook or you got to do all these advanced techniques within like these big companies when in reality, it's, it's for everybody and it's accessible for everybody and you can use it to whatever degree you want. You could use it for your own personal use. Like if you own a business or you like in your job, I think kind of breaking down some of these misconceptions of what data science scientists are of like, you gotta be a certain type of person, I think is something, you know, we can then introduce other people into, to the, not just R, but just any kind of language that can, you know, is accessible and useful for whatever resources or for whatever purposes it needed. Cool, thank you all. This has been super engaging. Um, I appreciate you engaging with this topic that's not uh, code centered. In some way, this is actually the single kind of oddest duck out of all the chapters because it's like where the other, the rest of the book is about kind of doing data science and education. This is about kind of like the pedagogy, the pedagogy of um, teaching data science. So um, thanks for this conversation. I um, learned a lot. I have a lot of good ideas for. Uh, kind of revisions of the book um, and <laughs> um, resources that we could create around the book. Um, there's a couple things I want to follow up on here. Um, I think that, yeah, so thank you all. Thank you, Josh. Thanks, Josh. Thanks, all. Have a good night. Good to see you. Bye.
Mm-hmm. Mais 